Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ian Blatchford, uh, director of the Science Museum. Um, as I hope a um, ally for our intelligent conversation this afternoon, you might notice I have a wonderful portrait of Galileo behind me. Um, I think there are two messages from that. One is the power of knowledge and creative thinking. Also, in the short term, the danger of knowledge and creative thinking. Not that I'm threatening my panel with being sent to prison or reporting them to the Vatican for dangerous ideas. Um, and uh, also the timing of today happens to be quite interesting to me because we're opening in the Science Museum tonight an enormous exhibition about science fiction. And one of the um, great messages of science fiction is that wonderful Arthur C. Clarke comment that advanced technology and ideas often seem like magic when they first are suggested. So um, I'm sure we'll have some interesting and disruptive ideas from the panel. Also, I've had a little sneak preview at some of the presentations the panel are going to do, and I can see that they put a great deal of work in, so thank you in advance. Um, the format, folks, is that we will have um, our panelists in order. I uh, may ask one or two questions uh, after each presentation. I will also keep an eye, if I can, on the, the uh, Q&A box um, and may bring in some questions early or right at the end. Um, given that I'm a man, I find it difficult to do more than one thing at a time. So I will try and listen to my panel and also keep an eye on the questions. And obviously I reserve the right to um, rephrase a question if it makes no sense and ignore a question if it's just gratuitously offensive. But I think that's highly unlikely with this panel. So uh, let's dive in and um, we're going first to uh, Celia, and Celia, um, uh, it's wonderful. I can't wait to hear from you, particularly because um, I had the misfortune of being in Paris in the summer in that week when there were record temperatures. And much though I adore Paris, I have to say it was a searing and shocking experience to see one of my favorite places in the world struggle with the reality of a warming climate. So if I'd known you, at the time, I could have called you and said, Celia, rescue me. Anyway, no pressure. Celia, I think we'll go to you first, please. Yes, thank you for the invitation. I don't know if I can rescue you, but um, <laughs> actually hot heat waves and adaptation is kind of a good topic and a good issue to talk about it today because, uh, when it's about uh, studies, academics, and uh, their contribution to public policy, I have to tell you that the first time I talked as a deputy mayor uh, of adaptation and heat waves, it was in 2015. And even with a major study about it, most of the people I was talking about were laughing, saying, stop with your ecological stuff. It's, it's, too, it's too much. That won't happen in France. So we had to have to experience to believe, and this is a bit of pity these days, and it's not only true for ecology, but for many, many different things. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. I don't know why I cannot. Okay, I have to stop this. So let's go. Uh, yeah, here we are. So really, thank you for uh, your invitation. So I'm Celia. I'm uh, the former deputy mayor of Paris uh, in charge of climate, energy, ecological transition and water uh, from 2014 to 2021, because I resigned in 2021. I'm a young retired from politics, a fellow a companion of uh, Anne Hidalgo, and to talk uh, about you about Paris, the climate action, diplomacy and academics. Let's tell me, let me first say a few words about the long run commitment uh, of Paris um, in, in the climate uh, action. Uh, as many cities around the world, Paris has been on the front line for many years, more than a decade to tackle climate change. As many other cities around the world, we feel like we have a responsibility, a high responsibility, being, being at the origin of 70% of GG emission with our activities and way of life, but also of the scarcity of natural resources. And being, being at the local level, we are like asked to act actually, and, and we feel more than maybe uh, the states. And what is good is that at the local level, we have good political tools to transform also current territory to act on 
and also a link to the citizens that we believe is not perfect but existing, which maybe um, ex explains why cities are on that front line and are convinced, I'm not the only one, that we are far ahead from states in, in that climate action um, uh, development as for decades now. For Paris, we have a climate roadmap since 27 through climate action plans, addressing mitigation in all fields of life, uh, transportation, um, uh, buildings, uh, food, everything. And since 2015, addressing that question of uh, adaptation. By the way, 2015 is not uh, a date by luck, but it was because uh, it was the time we had a big studies about how to adapt in Paris facing climate uh, crisis, but also we wanted to have that first adaptation uh, strategy in 2015 because it was, it was COP21 in Paris, and we wanted to focus on adaptation as a city to put it also at the agenda of the international level because it was the time that we had that big debate uh, about the green funds emerging. What I can say also is that Paris always like built its climate action plan on a comprehensive strategy, meaning working on three pillars, transforming, transforming through public policies, whatever they are, public, public uh, procurement, urbanism, whatever, the mobilization of the civil society from individuals, citizens, association to companies, but also more and more acting on the European and in the international level. As our issue is actually uh, the implication in diplomacy and on the international level, we uh, were um, seeing emerging from 2014, 2015, what has been called la diplomatie des villes, the town's diplomacy. I don't know how, if, if, if it's a good translation. And that took, uh, I, I would say, three main uh, ideas that cities were for a long time actually involved in many, many networks on the international scene. Considering climate issues, it was mainly for us in C40, that I guess everybody knows, energy cities, UCLG, ICLE, but not only the big ones and the comprehensive one, but also in very dedicated uh, networks. I'm thinking about Aqua Publica Europea, that, that is like a network dedicated to the question of public water, but also the Pact of Milan on food and, 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 and food uh, strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So it was like being quite involved. The second thing is that, that, that involvement, uh, commitment of the cities on the international stage was for me, it my, it's my feeling, but I think many of the actors would tell you it's that it's very much about cooperation versus competition. We heard in 2014, 2015, a lot about who's the best, who is like being the more attractive and uh, with economy and things. Coming to climate, it's a lot about cooperation, copying good ideas in the others, going together to face the big issues we have to, and we have to invent on it. You, you were talking about imagination. I think that's one of the points we should work a lot on it. And definitely COP21 was a turning point for all of us because it showed into the light that big uh, commitment about cities on the international scene. It was actually maybe also the first time that the big leaders of the city, not only the deputy mayors, but the mayors were going on the international scene with the picture of Anne Hidalgo, Michael Bloomberg, that I guess you know, and cities for climate being really put into the lights. I'm also just like saying shortly convinced that actually Unfortunately, um, the terror attack in 2015 changed also the way mayors were considering uh, this, uh, this implication on the international level and the solidarity between them and, and, and the, the, the way that they had to uh, prepare future together. So considering academics and politics in this uh, involvement uh, of uh, and engagement of the cities and local territories um, to, to face climate change, I would say, uh, obviously, uh, academics, uh, experts are really, really there to help us, but not that much, actually. Uh, we have a lot of studies that were like um, giving a lot of uh, data and, and ideas to build the transformative roadmaps of our city. Best example are the carbon footprint and the data of transformation, IPCC reports to buy to build the climate action plan. And also, I was telling you, uh, in 2012, we were leading these big, big, big uh, studies about the strengths and vulnerabilities of Paris facing climate change, but also natural resources, oh, sorry, there's a word missing, scarcity. It was like 
huge uh, study. But even if we had like the best experts of climate and of uh, social uh, impacts uh, working with us, that study made actually a big of laugh and nobody really believed about what we were saying about that. So this is like the first a weakness of uh, that collaboration and I would say it was also linked to what I would call the different levels of interaction uh, interaction the thing is that we have a lot of experts around us but not a lot of people within that political uh, establishment is working with them we were actually in 2014 a few of civil servants very much linked with the scientific sphere with IPCC actually in Paris uh, with a lot of experts and a few, I had to say, of political representatives. So the link is there, but it's very, very tiny. But I have to say there is a growing interest that is total, totally linked to the rise of the public opinion awareness. And the situation, situation changed a lot between 2014 and today, which is a good thing. And now, uh, like, uh, there are more, more the idea that political is addressing these people to have ideas. But for me, there is still a big gap between expertise and the political world. And I think the best example I can give it to you is uh, about the politics of tackling air pollution in Paris. In 2015, during COP21, some professors from LSE came to Paris and they asked me that question. They were saying, well, that's great. May your Dalgo address the air pollution issue. And you have to remember by that time that it was a big fight in Paris and that everybody was complaining against uh, with the reduction of uh, individual cars. It was really, really awful for us. And they told me, tell us what she read, what studies she had in her hands to decide this, because we want to produce more to make politicians uh, decide. And I was really, um, <laughs> uh, really bad saying him that actually studies were not the key point to make political decision. But at that time, for sure, we had scientific studies focusing on the impact of health. More and more people were talking about it. And it was a big issue during the 2014 political campaign. Obviously, there were also the COP21 effect, but what made Mayor Dalgo decide to really struggle and fight and change and disrupt, as you were saying, was actually that she was threatened by the lobby. I really saw it. She knew there was something, but it was that threat that convinced her she was on the right way. So just to show you that, well, science is something, but in the political world, unfortunately, not enough. So for us, when we have to go for uh, data and ideas, we go first, I have to say, to civil society before academics. NGOs are still uh, one of our first people, uh, politician, the political world goes to. The local authorities network are very, very important. And maybe we can talk about it, but I think today it's maybe the best ambassadors of the academic world. Also, we turn to thinkers of the ecological transition. I'm now thinking about, I don't know, like Rob Hopkins or that kind of people that are really listened to, depending on the sphere you're, sphere you're involving. And more recently, at last, IPCC leaders are uh, common to see in city halls. Uh, you have to know that in, in four, four, four years ago, uh, this, the climate councillor of Anne Hidalgo asked me who was Valérie Masson Delmotte for me is the queen of IPCC, but he didn't know who it was saying, well, she, she talks really well, we have, to, we have to ask her if she can help us. So that's to show the, the gap that we have started to bridge, but not that much. Uh, also maybe what explains that that link is not that, that strong between academics and cities is maybe the goals that we had on the international scene until now, this is changing as well. In 2014, 15, 16, the idea was just to exist in a way. It was to promote the, uh, the, the local authorities among uh, non-state actors on the international level, uh, to show the leaders, the national leaders, how cities were actually a big contributor in, in reaching um, INDC targets. We wanted a chair around the table and that was not easy at all uh, if I refer uh, to COP20 and COP21. Also beyond planification issues, we wanted to show the strengths of local solution. We had the feeling that international sphere were always like setting targets, revising targets and again targets, but not like going into concrete and into the implementation issue that's something we wanted to show also we wanted also to get supports to get further money 
not going through uh, national states, but directly plugged to uh, local ter territories. And I have to say, maybe we are definitely better in having a specific influence through dedicated networks, when they're like specific networks into energy, water, food, whatever. There are like topics that maybe we are better in working on it, going more into details and having like specific influence on a specific institution, I'm thinking uh, on Europe then. So definitely, and I hope I'm not getting too long, but there is a cooperation existing, but that needs to be uh, reinvented. One of your question preparing uh, that session was like city states and academics. I don't know really um, what uh, what I, we were you were asking about that, but what I can say is that definitely on the international level, we could feel that state doesn't really want cities to be there. So that is like more of a political uh, fights, but it went about to speak with academics and, and consult them. I think we have nothing to, we have no problem with states because most of the time we know these academics before them because we are years ahead in the climate action uh, uh, and in implementation. So for instance, uh, in France, we had a citizens conference on climate issues uh, two, three years ago before COVID. We actually did exactly the same in cities five years ago. Uh, we also have created places to share that forum about climate that is led with, with uh, the uh, by the IPCC leader Jean Jouzel, that is really like a meeting each year for now 10 years between social society, civil society, people of Paris, and the expertise uh, of academics. This is existing. The Climate Academy has been built by Mayo Dalgo for now three years with the idea that we have to share with the youngest one all that knowledge uh, uh, that we know. So we definitely have to event, and I feel still the uh, need to bridge uh, that gap between experts and the political world. And I have to say, to conclude at this point, that I don't really have all ideas to make um, that, that cooperation works. I would say two things. I feel it very, very urgent to find a way to, uh, to, to bridge the gap because we are at the point that I guess you all uh, would say the same that um, the information is going really quick. We have a lot of fake news. Political world is really, let's say, with a lot of people sometimes a bit lazy, not reading that much, and saying saying kind of stupid things. Also, let's say we can we could talk about the jumper to where to tackle a climate change point. That is a big debate these days in France, brought by a minister. When we see the urge of the emergency of climate change, this is not enough. But at the same time, you have a lot, a few people among these politicians that are really working, working uh, a lot. So I think definitely, I have the feeling I have one idea which I would tell you is that I think that the local, uh, the network of local authorities could be one of the key points to make that link work uh, better for me it's really the place when you're a politician that everything is going really fast that you cannot read everything when you can find kind of a translation because these networks and i'm thinking of one that i really love that is energy city are focusing on really really detailed uh, issues going really into in deep into to find solution and then to translate it into political action and i think this is maybe one of the key things to um to work on it with imagination that you put in your introduction i completely agree with you we have also to go and disrupt and, and go beyond what we all know so that is mainly what i could tell you about my uh, paris experience and uh, and that's it thank you celia great um can i just ask you some quick questions now before we will come back to you later but um first of all um in all the uh, meetings we all go to about climate change, the Paris Accord is still this great revered moment in climate negotiations. And we all cling with our fingertips to keeping alive 1.5 degrees. I wonder whether you and your colleagues in Paris feel a particular burden of expectation because Paris is seen as this great moment in the climate movement. You think that of all cities, Paris feels a particular obligation to lead or, or have your politicians moved on from that moment? Because I remember France being overcome with joy at what was a, a awesome diplomatic triumph. That's a really good and tricky question. Um, 
<laughs> yes, Franz was transported with joy. But the thing is that one month ago, before the, ev the event, I think, again, only a few people really understood what, what was going to to happen. Though. So that's really also a question. Yes, I, I, as a city, we feel the burden. We feel the responsibility. And um, and actually also in, in the idea to gather cities and to act together and to make this cooperation and solidarity remain. So to this extent, yes, a lot. And as I was telling you, it was really, really incredible in 2015 when COP21 occurred to me, actually. And I think it was really uh, lived the deck in Paris. It was just one month after the terror attack. We, we had the feeling we were building really, uh, it was not about the planet, it was about our way of living about society about what we expect for future so did this make it like a step for cities and local authorities and all the people coming from all around the world 1000 mayors were feeling that so that was interesting but unfortunately i have also to say that the, the, the french debate is quite bad these days and uh, after covid uh, i heard a lot of people saying well no health and economics are important and so now it's really to find the right balance and, and not to stop uh, fighting because it's still a fight. Yeah, I've also learned and never ask a Parisian taxi driver for their view on measures to improve the environment in Paris. Let me ask you another question. You said something wonderfully frank, actually, which is, although in forming your policies, you had talked to the academic world, their influence, your phrase was, not that much. I wrote that down because I thought that was that was almost like a wonderful English understatement. But here's my question. Isn't one of the problems or the challenges that although you and I probably see a lot of academic work, of course, it doesn't all agree or on, or, or on the surface, you might get several studies about an issue. It takes quite a lot of concentration to see where those studies conflict, where they disagree. And an issue in this country, and I don't know if it's an issue in France, is that either the ecological wing or the right wing press will take those differences in academic studies and magnify the difference to suggest that there is a consensus, whereas you and I might know there is, but communicating that to our political leaders, I find, clearly you find, very difficult. Yeah, it's, well, I, I have to say that First, I, I was consulting the academic boards with a bit of maturity. Can we say that in English? Because when I entered the, the political world, uh, I, I was not that good at the climate action. I mean, even coming from the Green Party, I had to learn a lot. So the idea is first to make people learn, and that takes time. Uh, then secondly, um, I'm not sure I got totally the question, but the thing is that uh, the political world doesn't take time actually to enter this yeah that's yeah. that's my question in, yeah in other it words, doesn't if take time and just take like yes. the, the super fresh yeah what they want to what they want to read and what they want to say and they take like just part of it so and it's true also that i have chosen from sometimes to just speak with the one that i agree with well well that i feel not that, that, that we agree but that i had like a human feeling helps a lot and then like to to share uh, ideas so uh, what is sure is that, to me, what is really good is that academics becomes politics in the really good sense of it, like the IPCC started to do it, it's like not just give data, but give clear signs of where we should go and how we should do, not being neutral, I think this is something that would be really good for the political world and for the whole society, just I mean like, you're convinced of many, many things, so you have to say it loud, we need it. Now, you said something very interesting there before I go to the next panel, which is I, if I look back over the years of the IPCC reports, they have become much more skilled, haven't they, at actually uh, condensing a lot of amazing work into key messages. I mean, you and I know the people who work on these reports are world leaders in terms of academic skill. But actually, I think optimistically, and I wonder if you agree, they've learned what I call street fighting skills. They've learned how to take nuanced climate models and dump the nuance and be clear. Do you think, do you think they have learned how to fight in the political arena a bit more? First, they have incredible people. 
people. I mean, I was really mm. like shy when I met them at first, thinking that we cannot discuss because they are too high, high for me. And actually, the first thing they do is like they just talk normally and help and help you to understand. This is the big thing. Yeah, and I think they're not naive. Now they they know how to fight. I mean, I, I only know well uh, the French one, but I mean like uh, Valérie Masson del Mode, Jean Jouzel, François Jimen, just open their mouth and say what they have to, and they know how to shake. Like, for instance, I think Valérie de Masson del Mode know how to shake the establishment, but not to go too far away, just to remain that authority she has. It's, it's, it's really complicated. It's like the political world, but there are, be, there are being political actors in the right definition of that, of that word. And, and that is, yeah, I think, I think they, yeah, they're really good. I mean, yeah, between 20, uh, 2014 in Lima and 2020 in, um, in Glasgow, there was like a huge, a huge uh, 2021, sorry. Yeah, they have, they have changed, but we changed too. We all changed. By the way, I'm amused by something you said, and we'll move on to David in a second, which is that I had the same experience as you, which is that often when one's talking to academic colleagues, uh, one's nervous at saying to them, I have no idea what that paragraph means. Give me a simple... And then you realise, almost invariably, that they welcome that contribution. They may well have won the Nobel Prize in economics, and you and I may be just simple human beings. But actually, in my experience, most scientists and experts are surprisingly receptive to some things that we might say to them. In general, people that are clever don't have to big problems with their ego and, and things to prove to others are really good people to speak with, right? Yeah. There's an optimistic thing. Yeah, as we we're have early to. in this session. Yeah, exactly. Studies Clever are not that <laughs> optimistic. We have to. <laughs> Celia, that's great. Um, we'll come back to you. There will be questions from our audience. Let me move um, to you, David, on um, the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, let's hear from you, please. Thank <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks very much. Ian, <clears throat> let me just clear my throat. Thanks very much, Ian and uh, Celia. It was very interesting to hear your take on the work of Paris, which I'm familiar with from uh, uh, another perspective. Um, uh, so merci beaucoup, uh, très intéressant. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here. And I will get my slideshow up and running. Now, hopefully, can you see that, Ian? Yes, we can see that. Yes, well, it's the wrong slide, but here we are. Um, so I, I want to speak uh, about the, the sort of direction we've been given about how cities work together. Are they actors in climate change? Are there any recent examples? What's the role of higher education research institutions and what are the key challenges in the cities and I'll, I'll try to do that in 10 to 15 minutes but I, I did want to preface it just by saying I, I think that last conversation is very interesting from my perspective and my background is as an elected official in uh, as Celia's is from my perspective one of the challenges in climate change and some other issues is that uh, the academic world acknowledges as it should uh, doubt and questions and uh, parameters. And in the political world, you need to be clear and straightforward and much more certain. And so there's a different kind of conversation that goes on. And I think the very best politicians on the issue of climate change, as on many other issues like inequality, the economy, um, public health, are working from solid science. But they speak to people in ways that people will hear much better because they speak clearly, simply, uh, and with a clarity of purpose. And I, I've often thought one of the reasons that climate change action has been challenging, in addition to, of course, the entrenched interests of the fossil fuel lobby, who work very hard globally to undermine the narrative, is that in the certainly in the early years, the IPCC reports weren't delivered in that way. And as you pointed out, Ian, they're starting to be now. Uh, but I, I think it's a very critical part of the issue. So <clears throat> I'm 
David Miller, as everybody knows, my current role is managing director of the C40 Center for City Climate Policy and Economy. This is a new think tank that the C40 started in January this year in order to bring together mayors, their key policy advisors, the academic world, and practitioners in order to produce timely evidence-based research uh, that helps drive an urban climate agenda. And it specifically is thinking to uh, how do we create structures of collaboration between those groups that will empower mayors and the city governments they lead on climate issues, science, and also economic issues, because at its heart in many ways, the climate crisis is a product of the economic arrangements that we've chosen, particularly um, what I would call neoliberal economic thought and ideas since the late 1970s. Um, in terms of what cities are doing, I've written a book about it. Uh, it's called Solve. So if anybody's interested, I would not call that an academic book. It's from a, a politician's perspective, but it speaks to how cities are acting on climate globally, including the great work of, of Paris uh, under Mayor Hidalgo and, and Celia and others. We know the context. We have to act today. Uh, science tells us, and the mayors of C40 rely very heavily on this science. Science tells us that uh, we have to do everything in our power to keep overall global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, no more. We're very close, and some scientists tell us we're, we're already past the point of no return, but we're very, very close to uh, 1.5 degrees now. And in order to do that, we have to have global emissions, more or less, by 2030 on a path to net zero by 2050. So that's, that's what science tells us. Um, cities matter not just because of the personal leadership of people like Mayor Hidalgo, Celia, and others, but because from <clears throat> 2008 or nine onwards, the world has become urban. So from the dawn of human settlement till about 10 years ago, the world was predominantly rural. It's now predominantly urban, and it's becoming more so. And that's because of the rise of megacities in places like China, and the flight to cities in places like uh, India, uh, yeah, Latin America, and Africa. So cities are becoming <clears throat> more and more important from a public policy perspective on this and many other issues. They're the majority of the world's population that's increasing, the majority of the world's economy, most of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, most of the world's energy, and quite worryingly from a resilience perspective, many of the new cities are in fact almost all of them or at least the urban expansion is in areas that are prone to uh, very serious problems from climate so cities uh, are where the people are where the emissions are where the economy is and because they're where the problem is they can also be where the solution is and cities are taking strong action and i'll uh, get to that in a minute but it's in the context of government inaction now, since <clears throat> this chart was printed, Denmark has moved up and Denmark, it now appears is on a 1.5 degree trajectory, but that's it. That's the only nation in the world. Many have pledged, but no one is on a strong enough trajectory. That was supposed to be addressed in Glasgow last year, and it wasn't. And from my perspective, that made Glasgow fail, at least in its international diplomacy, nation to nation. However, there was an incredibly strong presence of cities in Glasgow. National governments made some promises, but some of them simply don't have credibility. For example, global leaders pledged end deforestation by 2030. How are they going to do that? What is the plan? There's no plan. Unlike that lack of action, Cities, <clears throat> led by the largest cities in the world, the members of C40, do in fact have plans and actions. And we just heard some significant detail about Paris. Uh, Mayor Hidalgo was the chair of C40, and she was a member of the steering committee post-Paris, which uh, agreed <clears throat> that every C40 city 
had to have a climate plan in accordance with science. So whether or not a particular mayor was working uh, with scientists, C40 through a partnership with uh, Arab engineers uh, developed an analysis of the carbon budget that the, the group of cities as a whole could emit if the world was gonna be on a 1.5 degree pathway no more and created a program where each city had to develop a plan to meet that target of capping emissions. That was called Deadline 2020 because in the global north, um, uh, cities needed to peak emissions by 2020 on the way to having by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. Have all of the cities done this? No, about two thirds of the 97 members have. Uh, particularly in the developing world, there were some real challenges because of COVID, uh, but uh, the cities are well on their way, unlike national governments, which are making pledges with no plan, no funding and no action. And it's important to think about diplomatically where the cities are going uh, with these initiatives, because unlike national governments in Glasgow, cities work together uh, with the climate champions through the city's race to zero to broaden this movement. And in Glasgow, it was announced that over a thousand cities and local governments had joined the city's race to zero, which is a commitment to uh, analogous standards to those C40 standards. So those uh, cities that have signed on to the race to zero have committed to um, have committed to developing a climate plan over the next two years from Glasgow that would do their fair share of having by 2030 on a path to net zero by 2050. And I should say this program was really driven by C40 chair, Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, who was uh, Mayor Hidalgo's successor as chair. And this initiative came about because C40, Global Covenant of Mayors, the World Wildlife Fund, Carbon Disclosure Pro uh, Project, ICLEI and others created essentially an informal diplomatic network to ensure that an alliance of cities could be built and succeed. And these cities, the thousand plus cities that, that have signed on to this pledge uh, are using the knowledge gained by C40 cities who were the first ones to implement these plans in looking at what they can do in terms of their actions. And each city had to pick areas of actions they're going to take. Roughly speaking, 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world are in cities. And roughly speaking, most of those are in how we manage our waste, how we generate our electricity, our transportation systems, and heating, heating and cooling our buildings and constructing them. So transportation, buildings, waste, energy. Each of these plans will address those areas. And in some places, New York, for example, uh, addressing emissions from building is the most important thing because it has an excellent public transport system and far more people rely on public transport, walking and cycling than other places. But there will be other cities where it's a different issue that has to have priority. The key is that each one through this international collaboration, building on what science tells us is necessary, has created a plan and agreed on areas of actions and will be required to report out their actions publicly. So a few quick examples of what cities are doing to accelerate climate action. In Glasgow, uh, C40 in partnership with some other organizations announced a billion dollar standby fund to purchase electric buses in Latin America. So to transform uh, public transport from polluting diesel uh, to, to clean uh, electric buses. Uh, the uh, Danish cities and towns announced their program, the results of their program actually in partnership with C40, which developed uh, 1.5 degree compliant action plans in Denmark. And there's now 94, almost all of the cities and towns in Denmark have such strategies. A new coalition to address emissions from construction of buildings itself. Uh, including working with industry and organizations like the International Woodworkers of the World uh, Trade Union, whose members, of course, will benefit tremendously if 
uh, techniques are, are moved to be more sustainable. Um, commitments made on this issue by cities as diverse as Mexico City, Budapest, uh, Los Angeles, about reducing embodied carbon in new buildings and real progress uh, on, on this issue uh, since Glasgow. Um, Montreal has essentially announced programs to phase out the use of fossil fuel gas in new buildings by 2025. So really quite interesting and amazing uh, progress. Couple more points I wanna make and then, then I'll wrap up uh, so we can take questions. The evolution of the ultra low emission zone in London, England is a textbook example of how a city can use science smart communications and public policy to drive climate results. London spent a year and a half analyzing the um, uh, impact of poor air quality on the health of young people and children. And as a result of that brought forward a public policy to say, uh, we will uh, broaden the area in which people have to pay a charge to come into central London as a public health measure. And by the way, it will also significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions. And they were so successful in using strong science and proving the case that on the BBC, and I happened to be in London that night, on the BBC, when uh, the um, ultra low emission zone was announced, the BBC interviewed a, a van driver who said, I don't want to pay 10 pounds to go in the center, center of London. I think this is unfair. And then they interviewed um, a, a school headmistress. And they were talking to her about health and air quality and children. And they said, what's behind you on the wall? And she said, oh, those are the racks of asthma puffers for our children. And from a political perspective, the issue was won at that point. And Mayor Khan went on to be very easily reelected because of the work that had gone on to prove the case that this really was uh, a health issue that was impacting uh, the health of children of, uh, of London. Um, one of the interesting things about cities, and I think it's responsive to one of the questions that, that uh, I was asked about cities navigating the political environment and collaborating with each other, is Los Angeles and Shanghai working together on the first green shipping corridor. And shipping is, is an issue that in certain ways is way outside the jurisdiction of cities, although ports are in cities, and many cities like Los Angeles own the port, but the oceans are, are obviously uh, international. And this initiative, which was announced a few months ago, uh, starting with one ship, but it has spurred considerable action and a significant partnership with companies like Mayersk to really explore how do we green shipping corridors? How do we take the fuel from the most pol polluting, worst, lowest grade fuel to something clean? And because the cities took the leadership, at a time, by the way, when the US and China diplomatically were having very serious difficulties, Two cities, Shanghai and Los Angeles, were able to collaborate and start this global discussion. And we are going to see shipping significantly greened. And when it happens, it, people who trace things back should trace it to, to this initiative between these two great cities. A few other things that that kind of leadership has happened, divestment, London and New York, uh, six years ago announced, you know, these are the two fin global financial centers of the Western world, uh, announced that their city governments were going to divest their pension funds from fossil fuels. And um, uh, that has led to others having permission, like university pension funds, who, who were uh, very reluctant uh, to take this step for, for many years. So another example of International collaboration of cities breaking barriers. Uh, renewable energy uh, and more uh, uh, is, is being pushed by cities, again, even when they don't have specific jurisdiction, 
Melbourne, for example, has convened a purchasing cooperative with other big institutions like hospitals and universities in order to buy purely uh, clean energy and therefore transform the electricity grid, even though they don't run it. Um, two other points I wanted to make in terms of these breakthroughs. Oslo is leading the world in saying, how do we create a budget that includes our impact on climate? So if you want to build a curling rink in Oslo, you have to have a climate allocation, not just a financial allocation. Really powerful, uh, still under development, but really pushing the envelope. And it's my hope that breakthroughs like this, as cities show the way, will lead to breakthroughs for national governments. Um, much more happening, 15-minute city all over the world, led by Paris and Mayor Hidalgo, equity and inclusion. Extremely important because mayors don't just represent climate change, they represent people. And where's people place, people's place in these answers? Final point I wanted to make is about my home city of Toronto. As a result of Toronto's climate plan developed in 2007 uh, and renewed in 2017, the greenhouse gas emissions of that geographic area of about 3 million population, the economic heart of Canada and the business center of Canada, uh, are now 33% below what they were in 1990. So not only are these actions replicable uh, across international boundaries through associations of cities like C40 and the cities race to zero, they actually work. Um, and that is a critical point. Uh, the economy of Toronto has grown significantly since 2007, perhaps in fact too much judging by the price of housing but at the same time, they've managed to dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions. And it's these kinds of issues, initiatives, thinking that we're trying to bring together in the center so that mayors can rely on the best science, the best economic analysis, and do it in a way that is both timely and can be communicated properly and broadly so that people understand. Um, I think those are the points I want to make today. I've been a bit longer than I meant to be. Apologies for that. And I'll stop sharing. And I look forward to the conversation. David, great. That was fascinating. Um, I don't think you can stay for the full session. So if people have questions to put to David now, maybe they might share them with me. But I've just got a comment and a question. First of all, I, I couldn't agree more about your comment about uh, the Mayor of London, because obviously I'm in London. And it's a, one, it's a wonderful, interesting thing. So as you say, the science was very robust. But what sold it was cute eight-year-olds saying, I can't breathe properly. So, so the classic way of communicating would be to get Professor X to come on the BBC and talk about the results. Actually, what could have been a huge kind of backlash against the low emission zone was destroyed in about two days. You witnessed it, didn't you? It was absolutely yeah. amazing. Never underestimate the power of cute eight-year-olds. Extraordinary. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question because I'm so uh, fascinated by the city issue. Um, and you said something at the beginning, which I think uh, is a good starting point, which is that, you know, we live in an age where um, it's very easy to kind of endlessly make snooty comments about politicians, but actually politicians have to find the pragmatic pathway, don't they? Uh, and the reason this is on my mind. I met an amazing guy recently, maybe you know him, called Aditya Thackeray. And he is the uh, sustainability minister for Maharashtra, in which, of course, the biggest city is Mumbai. And, and the reason it interests me this is, you know, India, as you know, as a country, is struggling with how it's going to meet its carbon emission targets. Um, you know, they've set a target of 2070, and the Indian government has to kind of gear up in a way that's going to be very complex. But this guy this takes a different view, which is none of that should stop them moving. Um, and already he's got big plans for a huge electrification of the transport system, greening the city. But here's my question, David. I said to him, uh, what are you doing with the advice? And he said something that is a very political answer. He said, I just need to know enough. I don't need the perfect answer all the time. Because if I wait for the perfect expert advice, I'll lose a decade. I don't know everything. I know enough to know roughly what the plan is like, and I'm just going to start. And I wonder whether that is the point about um, uh, cities, which is actually they're going to make some mistakes. But most of the key stuff that needs to be done 
it's kind of pretty clear. Yeah, I, I like his way of putting that, Ian. I, I think it's compelling. But you need to know the right things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the good thing about cities as institutions from the perspective of climate is it's the job of a mayor to make that city the best place it can be from my perspective for everyone. So my, my view and certainly how I acted when I was in office was <clears throat> it's the job of our city government to produce policies that, that ensure that everybody has a part to play in the life of the city and everybody is, is better off. And if you think about the best kind of climate actions, they actually help produce that kind of city. Yeah. You know, excellent public transport um, is, is a way to fight inequality and exclusion. Yeah. Because everybody can be everywhere relatively cost effectively. Um, ensuring that housing, particularly low income housing, is properly insulated and uses less uh, fossil fuels or none actually is a leveler as well. Because it lowers people's costs quite dramatically. And <clears throat> by the way, you know, the, the UK has really lost its way on this. It has some of the most energy inefficient housing in the world. And it, you can com combat all sorts of crises, including inflation, if you, if you think about housing properly. So if, if you look at what a mayor should be doing and think about climate as part of that, a really smart climate plan can actually drive those results. So in Toronto, our transit plan came about as part of our climate plan. And we wanted to expand the network dramatically. Um, and when we developed the transit plan, it included thinking about who you serve as your first priority, which for us was lower income neighborhoods, because in those neighborhoods, people didn't, in our context, didn't have access to rapid transit, they had access to buses, which when they drive in mixed traffic are slower. So uh, those that kind of link to up thinking, mm -hmm. um, which is what a good mayor does can produce tremendous results. And if you have the right knowledge, and I agree with Minister Thackeray, who is, is a member of the C40, by the way, um, the if you have the right knowledge and have enough of it, you can really drive those kind of results. But you do have to ultimately be based in science and facts. Otherwise, you can get some really offside results. You know, as we've seen through uh, the, the change to economic institutions over the past mm. 40 years, which have produced huge inequality in the climate crisis. So you, you want to be thoughtful about it, but he's right, and you put it very well. So a question that's um, come up from one of the people listening in uh, is um, obviously in your role, you're receiving a lot of research, but do you get much opportunity to generate research in areas where you want to know more or where actually the research is very weak? To what, what extent is there a kind of, you're both, both receiving but also commissioning research? Yeah, we're trying to provoke research. If we have some more money, we'll commission it. Um, <laughs> good answer <laughs> well it's it has the benefit of being true um but we you know we have a, a journal uh that whose first issue is is going to be coming out next week called the journal of uh city climate policy and economy it's published by the university of toronto press and we've deliberately created that as a place for a conversation between academics mayors practitioners um, uh, and uh, I'm missing a group, doesn't matter, um, so, and mayor's policy advisors, so that you, you can produce academic papers there. You can also produce commentaries or policy guidelines based on academic papers, and it's peer-reviewed. But the first issue, for example, has Mark Watts from C40, our executive director, and Arab, talking about how they developed deadline 2020. So there's the political layer from Mark and the, the practitioner slash scientific layer from the engineers at Arup. You know, here's how we defined carbon and created a budget for this group. 
with a commentary by Marx saying, here's how we drove it politically. And our goal is to provoke research through special issues on topics that really matter to the mayors. So we won't say to the academics, you, you need to you know, have this answer, but we'll be saying to the academics, here's the area that the mayors have a question in. So a bit later, maybe halfway through next year, we hope to have a special issue on ecological economics with our uh, special advisor, Herman Daly, who many see as one of the uh, fathers of ecological <laughs> economics. And why are we provoking that conversation? Because um, it's quite clear that, that traditional economic thinking doesn't include the planet and our impact on it. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna solve climate change, you need to include the planet and our impact on it. But how do you do that at a city scale? And, and what's the enough of the answer that mayors need in order yeah. to act wisely? Um, and that's, so we're trying deliberately to provoke that kind of research and thinking through the journal that has Great. political aspects, academic aspects, policy aspects. One more question, then I will go to our last panelist. So the other question that I'm sure will intrigue all of us is um, so on the face of it, cities are so different. I mean, I love Toronto. What a great place. But Toronto, if you, th if you think of like London and Paris, you know, kind of magnificent ancient cities, hardwired in their architecture and uh, utility systems and Toronto with its fabulous grid system. And then going back to the example of Mumbai or some of the great cities in Latin America, um, to what extent do you think that actually the knowledge transfer is going to get quite complicated and interesting, which some of those less developed cities might leapfrog and, and might teach some of you know the, the more developed Western cities a hell of a lot? Well, so first of all, I'm, I'm from a tiny English farming village outside Cambridge called Triplo. And <laughs> nobody on this call knows where it is, but they might know where Duxford Air Museum is. Of and course. I'm, I'm from there and ended up in, uh, you know, one of the world's great cities. I think it's a great question. And in my experience, particularly when I was chair of C40, I came in with the attitude of, you know, we're doing all this great stuff in Toronto. I'm, I'm going to help everybody else learn it and won't the world be great? And it turned out I, I couldn't have been more wrong. In fact, being part of a network like this, you learn more. And it's one of the yeah. things that's really important about having a network of mayors. And I particularly learned things from uh, the then uh, mayor of uh, Addis, who was doing some really interesting work. And I, I do think a lot of the work that's going on around resilience in particular in, in um, the so-called developing world uh, is really in cities there is really important. Uh, the, the other thing I wanna, other point I wanna make is these cities are all really different. Mm. Uh, Accra is different than Addis, it's different than Johannesburg. It's different than Toronto, obviously, than Buenos Aires, London, Beijing, Shanghai. But there are similarities. And the similarities are that the mayors face the same basic challenges. They, take, they face challenges from the impact of climate, which might be flooding or droughts or wildfires. They face challenges of inequality. They face challenges of the cost of housing. They face challenges of transportation. So all those solutions can be different. They're starting from a conversation about the same thing. And that's why the mayor to mayor networks are really powerful and important because they're, they've got the same questions. Yeah. And when you have the same questions, the answers are going to be similar. And I, I think that's why we believe there's a real role for, for the academic community if, you know, if we can help it talk in a way that mayors understand because there's the same questions and similar answers they can be looked at from an academic perspective and the insights can be really powerful and helpful one there is lots of questions coming i'll do one quick and then i'm very keen to go to you ada sorry we'll be with you i promise very shortly um one of the questions that uh is interesting here is that you set out very clearly just how um cities lie at the heart of trends in terms of population and, and concentration. So uh, 
two questions really. That would suggest that if the cities get it right, we're on a good pathway. But a question that I've been asked here is, but are you certain within your networks that some of those mega cities, China being one very good example, are they really on board? Because I, I, I think I, we're all feeling really inspired and by guiled by your narrative, but that assumes that all the cities where it matters. So for example, as you know, you know, a lot of African cities may be huge, but have low energy consumption, whereas Chinese cities, the energy consumption is simply astonishing. So is your network the great Trojan horse that is going to get us to the right position? What, or um, what are you going to do to make sure that the good knowledge of the best players is really shared? I, it's, it's a very good and fair question. And China always comes up whenever I talk about climate, as it should. And I, I think my answer, first of all, there are 16, I think, 13 Chinese cities in C40. And there's some really fantastic things happening there, like the world's largest electric bus manufacturers in Shenzhen, China. And it's no accident. They saw it as industrial policy, not just climate policy. So their entire bus fleet, 16,000 buses, is electric and their taxi free fleet is either entirely electric or almost there. Um, the interesting thing about China is culturally, if the government there makes a commitment, it has to deliver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the commitments they've made as a national government are not quite as strong as they need to be. Mm -hmm. But they've made commitments that they intend to deliver on. Uh, because that's the culture. And, you know, in our work with cities in China, the government has said, you can deliver climate strategies that are in excess of our commitment. And we're quite quietly, not in the glare of the media, but working, we as a network are facilitating work between cities like Copenhagen and Chinese cities on issues like buildings, which is a huge issue in China from a greenhouse gas perspective, because there's so many buildings and so much growth. Um, so I, my, I think a fair answer is it's complicated and have, you know, has C40 and Mark Watts, the executive director and David Miller, the managing director of this new think tank solved the Chinese problem? No, I, I wouldn't claim that, but I would argue that the bigger cities in China are on a path uh, that is really positive and are making a genuine effort, particularly around buildings, transportation, and increasingly on clean energy to address climate. And I think fundamentally, part of the reason for that is the air quality in some cities has been so bad that there was a risk of social dissent. And so in a, in a different kind of way to a Western democratic vote, there's been huge political pressure to act. And I think we're seeing the result, which is real action. Are they anywhere near where they need to be yet? No, but there is real action happening. And some of it's uh, at a scale that is enormous because it's China. Great, brilliant. Thank David, thank you so much. I know you may have to leave us. And if you, if you are still around, then we'll come back to you. Um, now, um, Ada, I think you're going to rescue us from cities for a bit. And yeah. I'm particularly pleased to hear from you because only this morning, one of my really bright curators came to me to say she wanted to do an exhibition called The Science of Ice. I think you might be the woman we need in our lives to help us look at uh, you know, these issues from a different angle. The floor is yours and sorry um, that it's taken so long to get you, but uh, now over to you. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ayn. So thank you for the invitation. So I'm Ed Ay, I am teaching fellow at the University of London Institute in Paris. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to take part in the seminar, which is on a very important topic, engagement of cities, politics and higher education institutes. So let me share my screen. Hope. Is it okay? Yes, we, we can see your slides. Okay, perfect. So I'm not an urbanist, so my field is international relations and I work on the Arctic region. 
Uh, therefore, I will first uh, adopt an international approach, then adjust and narrow it down, let's say a deductive method I'll follow. So um, I will uh, mostly focus on the scientific efforts, then I will focus on how they touch to these uh, cities in the region. First of all, I would like to start why the Arctic is important when we talk about the climate change and how it might help us to the southern countries with fighting against climate change. Uh, in recent decades, the warming in the Arctic has been much faster than in the other parts of the world, so this phenomenon is known as Arctic amplification. So until two years ago, we were saying that the Arctic is warming up to two times more than the other parts. Last year, in 2021, it has been three times. And this year, the Arctic is warming four times faster than the other parts of the planet. So when the Arctic is the roof of the world, so what happens there is returning to the southern latitudes, which affects us directly uh, here. That's why the Arctic states, cities, NGOs, and universities take, take this issue very seriously. And um, there are serious works going on in the region. So in this term, looking in the Arctic example might be very beneficial for us in our struggle here with climate change. Uh, Celia just mentioned that in 2015, people laughing uh, when you talk about the climate change, but I mean, in 2015, the situation in the Arctic about climate change was already so serious, like it was not early at all for the Arctic. So um, Arctic Council was founded in 1996 but by Ottawa Declaration. So there are eight Arctic states which are also permanent members of the Arctic Council. They are Canada, US, thanks to Alaska, Russia, Norway, Finland, um, Iceland, and Sweden, and Denmark, thanks to Greenland. Also, indigenous peoples are the permanent members of the Arctic Council, and um, they take very, very active role in decision-making process, because also it is sure that we need indigenous traditional knowledge in while trying to tackle climate change. So in this term as well, Arctic is important, I mean, to use the knowledge, traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples in climate change uh, science. So as non-Arctic states, there are 13 states who are not Arctic, but observer states. And for example, actually France and the UK are observers and France has an Arctic and Antarctic ambassador. Actually, uh, I don't know if Celia is still here, but actually it might be interesting to hear at what extent French Arctic observer status helps it in climate change. It was because one of the targets of France in asking observer status to the Arctic Council. Then uh, when we come to working groups, there are six working groups uh, working on the different environmental aspects of the region and as well as on climate questions. All these projects are identifying both a specific regional problem, for example, permafrost crisis in a region of Alaska, and at the same time, these groups prepare general reports to inform the public. So people working at these working groups are scientists, sometimes from different universities and countries, so it's very important that they share this information with their students as well. So I mean, Arctic Council and the same time political uh, forum, but in the same time, very scientific forum. It is the actually, you know, position, unique position of the Arctic Council. So on the other side, all these results of the works of these working groups uh, shape the Arctic Council work which make it a very, very special case um, in climate change uh, works. Then um, when we come to the scientists as actors, yes, scientists have an important role in creating the Arctic imaginaries. I mean, in our minds in South, 
uh, we have an image of the Arctic as cold region, like snowy and dark image. And by the increase of uh, climate change and increase of, of course, the visibility of the Arctic by the climate change, the alarmist scientific results started to increase. And uh, this situation helped to uh, form the public opinion as well. So here are some cliche photographs from the Arctic and about you know, climate change imaginaries rose by time uh, from the region. So the scientists also helped to decision-making process as in the case of Arctic Council. On the other hand, uh, science has the power to bring together different stakeholders as state officials, decision makers, NGOs, I mean, non-state actors, but also private sector, I mean, which has an important role in climate uh, change. So it's very important to bring private sector as well uh, to the uh, scene. So here, actually, one might say that the Arctic, in the Arctic, the official state officials, but also non-state actors and scientists are convinced to work together for this uh, climate change era. Uh, here, actually, in the Arctic, there are very well recognized uh, conferences. Each year, all uh, the stakeholders come together and discuss the difficulties and possible solutions or future projects rela related to environment, climate, and of course, uh, the politics of the region. Um, of course, when I mean, like someone says that, uh, talk about the carbon footprints uh, for, during these uh, conferences as well. This is another topic. Um, so if I come back to the conferences, so when someone says that Arctic frontiers, I know that it is on in Tromsø and it is in February. And or for Arctic Circle, it is in Reykjavik and it's always like in October, actually in which I'm living next week uh, to see what is happening in the Arctic climate. So, and on the other side, High North politics is about Arctic business in climate change era, where they discuss creating, for example, smart cities each year. So these conferences are not specifically organized by scientists. Actually, this is organized by cities and also by the government and the scientists all together. So these conferences are the product of all stakeholders. And we can use the metaphor of Agora, like these, these are Agora to discuss all rising questions and problems. And they have, of course, significance in producing knowledge and in adaptation of cities and uh, let's say countries in general to the climate change era. And last but not least, I have to also underline the importance of um, EU projects or national projects. Horizon projects focus on very different aspects and also national pro projects like INR projects in France, they are very important. Also the project that municipalities do, as in the case of, for example, Paris region founded my PhD project at the second year and sent me to the field work, very huge field work. And it was very like important for me. And this project was only about the climate uh, change. So this kind of projects or funds are important uh, for engagement of municipalities with uh, the scientists. Here, I wanted to show you a model. So here, um, first of all, we have to underline, of course, the cities are very responsible for climate change. They are responsible for 75% of global carbon dioxide. And still 72% of 200 cities uh, have not yet implemented climate adaptation plan. This is uh, serious. So according to this model, this model matching the future climate of a city with the current climate of another city. For example, according to this model, when you click on your city, you can see your twin climate city. For example, for Paris, its cl um, twin climate city is Cordoba in Spain uh, for the end of the century. And for London, for example, for 2050, it is Barcelona. Um, uh, the twin city. So this project is important uh, to identify 
future vulnerabilities. I mean, it doesn't bring solution, but it shows you, I mean, like it gives you a future scenario, but also for raising awareness, this is very important, but also it might strengthen educational times. Uh, ties. Just imagine like, you know, a cooperation between twin climate cities, just about climate change, like it might be very interesting, this kind of exchange programs, for example, it is, I mean, the, the idea uh, of this uh, project. For example, in Tromsø, in Norway, where I lived, they couldn't match this city uh, with another city in Europe because like, you know, in Tromsø, the city is geographically different. And the, I mean, the, in, it is affected very differently by climate change. So they couldn't match it within a, uh, with another city. So it shows like, you know, how Arctic is also impacted uh, very seriously by um, climate change. So uh, cities are actors as the most responsible for climate change. Yes, and that's why they have an important role in tackling it. That's why, as also Sally and David mentioned, like uh, big scale projects sometimes like, you know, they do not bring solution at all. That's why cooperation in mini club model is important. But big scale projects like COP26 is important to bring attention. I remember like last year, uh, at least two weeks, we were talking about COP26 with students, you know, what happened, what did you think about this, etc. It is just about raising the awareness of students or the public. It is really important. And engagement with higher education and research institutions is also necessary. But here I want to underline that, for example, IPCC reports or, for example, all the reports by, uh, produced by Arctic Council groups, etc., they really simplify those reports to be understandable because when as a simple person when you look at the ipcc report actually the language is so scientific and all those numbers and graphs so they also thought about this and they also prepare this for decision makers and uh, the public here one thing is important i guess while tackling climate change yes we'll write projects and the projects are increasing but the greenwashing is the thing we have to be actually careful because the distribution of the funds requ requires attention. So uh, to be able to understand the feasible project, again, cities like as municipalities, let's say, should engage again with scientists. Uh, because like, you know, my uh, colleague here, Edar, is also working on climate elites, like, you know, this climate change problem shouldn't create another sector um, during this, you know, era. So the targets of all these projects are, of course, resilient to um, climate uh, change. Here in the end, the question actually rises all my from this uh, PowerPoint is at what extent um, science has the capacity to inform uh, the policies. So now I will stop here and I can reply questions like if you have. Great, that was uh, very wide ranging. Let me, um, that what is really striking about um, your work is this. So uh, earlier, um, you know, Celia was talking about um, trying to use uh, scientific knowledge with politicians, and you know, David very much was looking at a politician. But but you spend a lot of your time with scientists, don't you? Clearly. So tell me, let's talk about them for a minute. What what are their hopes and frustrations in your experience about conveying their work? Um, because I, I know, uh, it's, you know, let's talk about the people with that knowledge and the experts. What's your view about what, what, what are their hopes and dreams in all of this? I mean, as a scientist in climate change or engaging with both, <laughs> engaging with the public. I, I, I mean, I t let me tell you a joke. I'll tell you why. Because one of my predecessors had worked at the British Antarctic Survey, and we did a gallery about climate change. And we did some uh, audience research on what people did and did not understand. And there was an area that they were very confused by. And he said, I've got the solution. We'll have more data and graphs on the display. And we said, no, 
the last thing you need is more data. People are confused. Uh, but he understood that actually a scientist's way of communicating is very data driven because that's why they're great. Um, you must you must experience that because you know you are you know respecting their work but also understand the communication challenges. What what advice would you give them? What's your sense of their strengths and weaknesses? Of those I'm in mean, communicating the science. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first of all, from my in my experience, for example, I try to you know what I learn in the north. I try to you know bring it here to share with people. First of all, with the students, and secondly, you know, with the public. What I can do. I mean, I can just you know engage with local politicians or I mean municipality and I tried it for example in France we have I mean at least the big uh, cities here they are green party they are from the green part mm. you know so I mean in their philosophy they are environmentalists etc so I mean it's not in Paris but in another uh, big city I engage and I you know send contacted the municipality and I said look like you know we have to start from the basics First of all, what about separating the garbage? Like, you know, we, <laughs> I don't want to throw my bottles anymore. I mean, just, you know, we should another, you know, garbage for this, but no answers. I mean, like, you know, the political willingness is very important. That's why um, I can't observe it here in South what I observe in the North, because in Ops, I mean, of course, there are different countries, different type of countries and population matter, et cetera. But here, the willingness, is not that much as in the north. As Celia just, you know, uh, told like people are laughing at you when you mention climate change sometimes. Like, you know, they are telling that, is it the issue now? Like, you know, economics are bad, et cetera. So you are just, you know, at the sideway. Yeah, that's, the, it, that's it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because in, uh, you, know, you know what's really interesting me in terms of the knowledge is that if you go back 10 years, our scientific knowledge about the, how the climate works still had many gaps. In, in, in the past decade, our knowledge of the Earth as a system has become vastly more sophisticated. In other words, we really understand vividly actually the consequences of climate change. But actually what you're saying is kind of uh, the fascinating thing, which is in fact our expertise and knowledge is so much greater but breaking through in your experience is still very hard. Is that, and, and do you think that is generally true or do you think it's because a lot of the world has been through such a lot of economic trauma and COVID that actually it's, people just don't want to engage, it's just too complicated. Yeah, I mean, like it was already complicated before the COVID, to be honest. Yeah. You know, uh, to, I mean, when you talk about climate change, people were uh, replying me, yeah, when I, you know, brush my teeth, I close the water. I mean, it is not about this, but when you go to your work, for example, instead of walking, you take your car. I mean, to convince people in their life is difficult. By the way, it is not my job because I'm a scientist. I can't just go to the public and tell this, this, this. That's why I try to engage with like, you know, the local, um, let's say, municipality to talk and maybe just, you know, develop projects, etc. This is the important part or this is the thing for how can I contribute at individual level? It is so difficult, like just to go everyone and to talk about this. I mean, this is so limited, isn't it? Yeah. But, um <laughs> I'm going to ask another question, but as someone's asked a question here, which if they can expand a bit, because it sounds like a great question, but I might get it wrong. They've got a question here, which is what should we trust more? I think quantitative or qualitative data, but whoever has asked the question, if they can expand that a little, we'll, we'll come back to you. Because I suppose what, but, but, but what's so interesting, and I think very poignant about the way you um, talk about your work, is that every scientist I know feels a passion to kind of do that communication themselves in every person they meet. That's one of the things that is so wonderful about scientists. But let me go back. So I was really interested in the Arctic Council because I don't really know much about it. But it sounds to me that actually there is this extraordinary center of expertise that isn't actually well, I mean, I don't know very much about it either. Uh, but, it, but clearly there is a huge degree of fascinating international cooperation going on that we don't really know about then. It is. I mean, indeed, the international cooperation in the Arctic is really 
amazing like you know i mean until february it was much you know uh, better let's say you know it was huge and today i mean like it is a bit like interrupted uh, by the war but still i mean the arctic council tries hard uh, to continue with the work because they were so afraid that their projects will be you know uh, interrupted because they are working on the environment like you know mm. and climate behavior because we still don't know like what is climate change or not what is climate change but you know to understand at 100% the behavior of the climate. We still like, you know, trying to understand all aspects of the climate. So it is important. I mean, here it is important that Arctic Council is has a very scientific work and international cooperation, but in the same time, it is very political and politics. I mean, in just one day can affect all the work of these, you know, scientists, which was the case actually, you know. No, um, I understand. Yeah. Now talking to, uh, um, personally want to ask that question i'm now talking to the organizer of the event if there is any way of that person being able to ask the question direct rather than be paraphrase it i don't know whether that's possible the quantitative quality qualitative question should we trust more quantitative or qualitative is yes that... you can see the question do you understand you probably understand the question more than i do yeah i mean it uh, is the question like if we should um <laughs> um I guess if I'm correct, like if we should trust more to numbers or to qualitative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I work on I, I my work is qualitative. So how can I say that I mean, we should <laughs> trust on quantitative work? I mean, like you know, it depends. I mean, you know, uh, on the work you understand. Like for me, I mean, uh, I'm a scientist. I I believe in both you know methods. So I can't just you know tell you. And oh, for for climate issues i mean when you look at the ipcc report they all put all these you know uh tab tables and stuff this you know explains but then they analyze it they wrote the right texas and texas so i guess in climate work we need both to understand better i mean if you're exact scientists maybe you can understand it better by graphics and you know tables but me for example i can understand by text so let me i think I, there's a sort of additional dimension which I, this might be our, our last question actually, which has come up quite a lot in meetings I've been at, which is that when we think of knowledge and expertise in the climate debate, we do default a lot to physicists, engineers, chemists, um, but um, a lot of social scientists feel very strongly that there are, there's a great deal of knowledge about nudge theory, social, um, uh, social change that actually could make a big difference if politicians were able to have access to that in terms of the kind of tipping points and, and uh, changing the mood around these issues. Do you think that actually in the whole knowledge debate around um, climate change and the UN process that social science needs a stronger voice? I mean, it is because like, you know, climate change, when you look at the history, you learn, I mean, there are climate scientists working in social uh, mm. era of, you know, climate science. It is important what happened to trace the, you know, story of climate change. It's important to go to the uh, history. So it's of course important. And I guess social science, I mean, I mean, in my uh, case, at least in the region of the Arctic, I mean, social science has its value. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe in also like uh, social science as the exact sciences, but here, yeah, it is especially, I mean, it's not very reality maybe, but our perception that like climate change uh, would be understood through better through uh, exact sciences. But I guess it's a perception. It's not the reality. Yeah. Great. Um, it's now almost 5.30 in London. And, and I think we have to come to, and then thank you for your, um, wonderful uh, presentation and um, uh, for the other panelists. And thank you also for those who've been listening in. And uh, as ever, I certainly feel I've learned quite a lot and I hope you have. So um, I'm afraid uh, I must now disappear and go to a party to celebrate the opening of our science fiction exhibition. Um, you may all be off to do many wonderful things, persuade politicians, finish a PhD, or actually um, do something else with your life. So thank you to the panel. Thank you to the organizers. I've enjoyed it very much. I hope you found it informative. And uh, for now, au revoir from London. Thank you.